Hello, this is Danielle Euler with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Today we'll be talking about bear safety for hunters. We're talking about bear safety because hunting puts us in a unique circumstance at higher risk for bear conflicts, especially during the time of year we're out there in the field. With more people on the landscape, as well as grizzly bears expanding their distribution and numbers, the chances of a conflict with a bear have increased. This map shows the general distribution of grizzly bears in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming as of 2017 and 2018. So generally, you can expect to see grizzly bears anywhere west of Billings at the time of recording of this presentation, fall of 2021. While grizzly bears are primarily seen within the hash marked occupied range shown on the map, they can be seen outside of those areas as well because they're moving into new places. This map shows a may be present concept for areas within and outside of the Yellowstone and Northern Continental Divide ecosystems, as well as the Cabinet Yak, Selkirk, and Bitterroot ecosystems. Again, anywhere in the western half of the state. There are three main elements to bear safety. Knowledge of the animals, awareness, how to prevent and anticipate the presence of bears, and how to respectfully navigate through bear country, um, knowing that uh, bears are powerful animals that are capable of injuring or harming people. However, most encounters can be prevented. Here are some basic understandings about bears. First, assume they can be anywhere. Black bears can be found in most of the state of Montana and grizzly bears in at least the western half of the state. Bear behavior rather than the species of bear should determine how you respond in a bear encounter and we will discuss how to identify bear behavior as well as species. And avoiding a conflict with a bear is a lot easier than dealing with it. So we'll start off by learning a little bit about bear life history. Black bears are animals that evolved in a forested environment so it actually changes how they perceive danger and how they might react to the presence of a threat such as a person. They tend to be less confrontational than grizzly bears because in their mind, the landscape that shaped this animal, when they see a threat, their instinct is typically to escape if that is a possibility or they may climb a tree or hide, um, but they could still be confrontational. This is just a general statement. Black bears are excellent climbers and they're the species more likely to be seen around people than grizzly bears. Now, grizzly bears evolved in open habitats, including the prairie, tundra, alpine meadows, and other open land, grasslands. And because of their evolution in these habitat types, when they see danger, they're more likely to confront those threats because there's not necessarily a place for them to escape to, and this natural disposition evolved with this creature. Grizzly bears are powerful uh, diggers, and you can tell by looking at their body shape that they are evolved for these open spaces and a lot of digging indicated by that massive shoulder hump, which is the tip of the shoulder blade and the attached muscles and, and ligaments. And grizzly bears are less likely to be seen in populated areas. It can also be helpful to understand how to identify a grizzly bear from a black bear. You could see both species in a lot of the state, and especially if you're hunting bears, this is an important thing to know. So the biggest indication of species is that on a grizzly bear, they have a shoulder hump, which is pretty easy to, sp to spot if you have their head up and you have a good visibility of the animal's body. Black bears, usually that hump is not present unless their head is down and they're feeding. So you have to look at them for a little while. Um, additionally, grizzly bears have more of a dish-shaped face and black bears more of a straight profile on their face. And the ears on grizzly bears are shorter and more rounded and black bears taller and pointier. Tracks are also a great identification feature. Um, there's lots of good resources online about this and I strongly encourage anyone interested in learning more about bear identification to check out our bear identification quiz on our website. So generally, just so you know, we talked about the main reliable characteristics for identification, but it's not a good thing to try to identify bears by their color, the size of their body, or their scat. These are unreliable. 
And to show you that, you can see here, these are all black bears. And their coat colors vary a lot, even within the state of Montana. And here are photographs of grizzly bears um, from around North America. And you can see that their color varies quite a bit as well. Grizzly bears and black bears both have daily cycles just like we do. Bears are most active, just like other game animals, in the early morning and late evening. This is especially true in the heat of the summer. And in the fall, as they begin preparing for winter, bears are active actually more hours of the day than they are earlier in the season. Females with their cubs can be active any time of day because often they're trying to avoid those peak feeding times that the other bears are using so that they don't have to expose their cubs to more danger. And bears also use beds just like deer and elk, so they will bed in places when the day is hot or when they are needing to rest. Um, and bear beds can be difficult to tell apart from uh, elk or, or deer beds. Uh, the presence of scat is a good indication of, of species identification, therefore the difference between a bear and a, another and a grazing animal. Bears also have phenomenal senses. Their sense of smell is extremely powerful. It is about seven times more powerful than a domestic dog. So that's why we really talk a lot about food storage and keeping people safe as far as bear attractants go. Bears have eyesight that's similar in quality to human beings, but they can see better in low light, so early morning and in the evening. They can run about 35 miles an hour, so about as fast as a horse at their top speed. And they don't really have any other physical disadvantages really to people. Um, we just have the ability to think ahead about possible conflicts with bears. In addition to daily cycles, bears have yearly cycles as well. So in the springtime, typically they emerge from their dens between March and mid-May. So first coming out of the den, the older adult males, adults without cubs, females with older cubs, and last, later in the spring, the females with the youngest set of cubs. Summertime is mating season for bears, as well as just an opportunity to find food wherever it's available, so bears can be found at any elevation during the summertime, varying year to year, depending on what food sources are most abundant. In the fall, bears begin preparing for hibernation, actually right around August, and then that continues, this period of hyperphagia or overeating continues from August through November when they begin to enter their dens. Fall is the time that we're most likely to have conflicts with bears because they're so focused on feeding that they aren't always as observant of their surroundings as you might think. So at the peak of hyperphagia, they might be active up to 20 hours a day and up to consuming up to 20,000 calories per day. So they really are driven by their food. And then in the winter, they begin to enter their den typically at the end of November or beginning of December. And then that cycle starts all over again with the females giving birth to cubs at the end of January or the beginning of February. Bears undergo hibernation as a way to survive a period of time where food is very um, difficult to obtain. So they live off the fat that they have accumulated in the fall before they went into their dens. So during hyperphagia, you may want to know where the bears are, and the best way to figure that out is to know what kinds of foods they're eating and to be aware of your surroundings in anywhere that bears are actively looking for food. Bears are omnivores. They eat plants, animals, and fungi, and they are taking advantage of any and all of those food resources that are available later in the year. Gut piles are more abundant during rifle season, but begin to show up um, during archery season in Montana. Um, berries are particularly a favorite food in the fall, and as well as other plants, tubers, roots, insects, and other, other species. Additionally, during hyperphagia, this is the period of time that we end up going into more places that bears are looking for food, and it's more likely that people are off trail and in places that bears are less likely to expect them than they are the rest of the year. In addition to, to the factors already putting humans and bears in similar locations in the fall, we also are going into habitats where bears begin looking for dens. So that's another factor that may put us close to each other. 
You should assume that bears are nearby, at least black bears, if not grizzly bears as well. Here are some signs you can look for to identify the presence of bear activity. So the common ones most people know are scat, tracks, and there are a few others that are usually from bear feeding. So we'll go through these. On the left side of this slide, you can see a bear bed and several scats, which indicates that this bear was using this bed for multiple days. On the right side, you can see a torn open log that bears were using to excavate maybe ants, grubs, or other insects, and a rock that's been rolled over by a bear, again, usually in search of insects. Rub trees are a great indication that you're, living, you're moving through a bear's home range. Bears communicate using rub trees so that other bears can smell that they've been there, and it may even help them find mates. So you can identify a rub tree compared to an elk or deer rub tree in that when bears make rub trees, they use their claws, so you'll see claw marks, and then they'll scratch their bodies, bellies, and backs on the trees to leave their scent behind. So it doesn't necessarily indicate that a bear is there right now or near or has been there recently, but it means that you're within the, the home range of a bear. Diggings are another great sign of bear activity. Grizzly bears and black bears will dig for food, but grizzlies are more known for this behavior. Bears that are digging in the ground are looking for small mammals, um, for plants, and also for insects most of the time, occasionally fungi as well. Grizzly bears and black bears consume hundreds of species in the Yellowstone ecosystem and beyond, so they're versatile at feeding and their curiosity is what gets them um, new food sources all the time. Bear scat comes in lots of shapes, sizes, and colors, so it can't tell you what species left the scat, but it can tell you what they've been eating. In addition to that, scat can't tell you how big the bear was. Um, there, a little bear can make pretty big scat, and big bears could have smaller scats, just depending on what they've been eating. So the photos here, top left, showing a grass-filled scat, as well as the bottom right. These are like earlier in the summer. The top middle and top right are showing scats that were created when a bear had been feeding on a carcass. And the bottom middle and bottom left are showing um, respectively rose hips and apples in bear scat. White bark pine is an important food source for some bears in, in certain parts of our ecosystems, um, some more than others. So white bark pine is mentioned in this presentation in case you find yourself in an area with a lot of this tree species at high elevation in the fall. Um, it's an area of a lot of wildlife activity generally, but also as a favorite area for some bears in that time of year. In, in other parts of the state, huckleberries can be a really important food source. So black bears and grizzly bears both feed on huckleberries. If you're in an area with, with lots of ripe berries, be aware that bears could be nearby. And any large animal carcass should cause you to, to move with extreme caution because even if the bear didn't kill the animal, if there's an animal dead on the ground that still is mostly intact or you know isn't old and dried out, there's a good chance a bear could smell it and be, be around there if it hasn't already discovered it. You can identify bears by their tracks. If you try to do this method, just make sure you're looking at the front feet um, instead of the back feet, because the back feet are a little harder to tell apart than the front feet for this identification technique. But essentially, on the front feet of a grizzly bear, the space between the toes and the pad is a lot more straight across. And on a black bear, that shape between the toes and the pad is more arched. In addition to that, the claws on a grizzly bear's front feet are very long, um, so they're, they're quite a ways away from the toe pads. So you can see here in this photo, this is a grizzly bear with the toes kind of in a, not a straight line, but they're generally straighter across. And you can see the claw, claw marks quite a ways away from the toe pads, about halfway between the toes and the top of the photo here in this photograph. And this photo is of a black bear track. You can see again here the arch shaped foot. And although the snow is crusty, the claw marks are quite close to the toes. Since curiosity is a survival strategy for bears, that means we need to be especially careful with our food and attractants at home and when we're camping to keep them out of trouble and keep ourselves safe. 
First thing, don't abandon any gear that's necessary for your survival. So even if it doesn't necessarily contain food or, or food odors, bears are curious by nature and sometimes they destroy equipment just for fun or again, curiosity. These uh, items are all what I would consider attractants or in other words, smellies, things that are not necessarily food, but they could draw a bear in for, for a look or a, a sniff. So all toiletries, toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, sunscreen, bug spray, um, we're not so much worried about these things on your body in smaller quantities, but the bottles of these items themselves are, are what we're most concerned about. It's always a good practice to, um, for anything that's not essential in the backcountry, um, not, to, not to wear heavily scented items gen just generally. Um, candles, dog food, or any pet food, drinks, um, canned goods, so um, whether it's a, a can of pop or a can of beans, even canned items that are completely sealed, bears can tell that there's food inside of them. Dirty dish water or clothes that you wore while you were cooking, or particularly if, it, you, know, if you got food smells or um, food spilled on the clothing, garbage, recyclables, in fact, any empty food or water containers, even if they are cleaned out, um, plastic really retains the smell of food, so they could still smell like food to a bear. Fishing gear or fish entrails, or for that matter, um, hunting gear or hunting packs, anything that has, uh, you know, you've, you've gotten an animal and you've gotten blood or other um, parts of the carcass on those pieces of equipment. And then obviously carcasses of animals are, are bear attractants. When you're camping, it's great to use a bear resistant container and in most areas of public lands where grizzly bears and black bears exist, uh, it's a requirement, but check your local regulations. You can use bear boxes, the bear resistant containers provided at the campsite. You can hang your gear. Um, I'll show you that more in a little bit. And then you can also store it inside of a hard sided vehicle with the windows up and the doors locked. Horse trailers can also be used as an effective food storage device, but you have to use caution and common sense. So there are no standards by which um, horse trailers are certified, but a fully enclosed trailer with, with um, no major slats for the bears to rip into or bend or break into the trailer, like the one here on the left would be a good option, but the trailer on the right, uh, bears could easily climb inside of this or rip and bend the aluminum to get what's inside the trailer. So um, horse trailers, if they're if they're the good uh, kind that works, that doesn't have a lot of easy access points for bears, then it could be an effective way to store an attractant. There are a lot of bear resistant food storage options available from coolers to backpacking canisters, electric fences, and horse panniers. Um, there's even a, a kind of a cloth bear resistant container called the Ursac. These are all good options. Just make sure you read the instructions and you know how to lock them properly, um, including for all the bear resistant coolers, they have to be locked with a padlock or nuts and bolts on each um, point on the corners of the cooler usually. Bear poles are the most common way that I've hung attractants in the backcountry. Typically the bag has to be at minimum 10 feet off the ground and four feet from the supporting trees next to it so that a bear can't stand on the ground and reach up and grab the, the load or climb the tree next to it and grab the load that way. For a full listing of certified bear resistant containers, including a lot of the ones I mentioned earlier, you can visit this website, igbconline.org, to find out what's currently certified and all these products have been tested by grizzly bears at the Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center in West Yellowstone. And just know that no matter what you're doing for activities or where you're going, food storage options are available. You just have to plan ahead and prepare. Bird hunters also need to be careful in bear country. Be careful especially in and along brush and especially when that borders a waterway like a creek because bears will bed in these areas and we've had um, we've had bird hunters who've been in bear conflicts around the, these kinds of situations. So walk with the wind so that the scent your scent is ahead of you and bear may smell you before it sees you. Uh, keep an eye on your dogs and if you see a lot of 
recent bear sign, you might consider hunting elsewhere for the day. Now let's talk a little bit about selecting a campsite. So when you're in bear country, places to avoid setting up a camp, um, if, if you are setting up an undesignated, like not a front country campsite, you want to avoid bear travel routes. So that would mean avoiding like game trails, regular trails, any easy walking corridor for a bear. Um, bears and other wildlife love to move along water bodies, so streams and creeks and rivers and lakes. Um, avoid setting your camp up close to those areas and that just avoids a bear walking right in through your camp because that's the way they were going to go anyway. You also want to avoid dense cover because you don't want to have a bear come into your campsite at night and then have no ability to look out your tent and see what's around you and it gives you a little more protection to be out in the open more away from dense cover. Also it may need it may go without saying but avoid putting your tent up in foraging areas, places full of berries, maybe nearby a carcass. Those are dangerous areas and you always want to keep a clean camp so that if somebody comes and, and camps there after you're gone, you haven't put them in danger and it's clean and safe for them to be there too, as well as for your safety while you're there. Please don't use fire pits as a place to dispose of your garbage or leftover food from, from camping. Um, this practice doesn't fully get rid of the food smells. It often attracts bears and it, on most public land it is prohibited. So keep, uh, keep your campsite clean and keep the bears out of trouble. Campsite selection is also important as well as separating the sleeping area from where you're eating cooking and hanging your attractants. So on most public lands and just a smart recommendation is that you stay at least a hundred yards, so the length of a football field, from where your your tent is to where your, your food and your cooking is going on. The hang itself and the area you cook don't have to be separated. They can be, but just make sure your sleeping area is, com is completely separated from that. The reasoning behind this is that hanging food in a tree properly still doesn't make it so the bear can't smell it. So the bear may come through your campsite smelling the food and then not be able to reach it. And we don't want them walking through the area that you're sleeping. Carcass storage is also really important when you're hunting. So no matter if you have a dead animal or you have attractants, remember that your attractants need to be stored properly Oh, at least a hundred yards from where you're sleeping. So you can't have anything even stored properly that's closer than a hundred yards for most of our public land to where you're camping. Now, so let's say your camp is, is in one spot, you're a you're hundred yards away, you have a game pole, perfect. You can get everything up off the ground over 10 feet off the ground and um, that would be great. Now, if you have a carcass on the ground, um, up pile any part of the animal that has to be a full half mile away from where anyone is sleeping whether it's you or other people so if you have an animal on the ground and for some reason it's closer than that to a sleeping area maybe a campground uh, make sure you report that to your local land management agency so that they can make necessary actions to to keep people safe. Um, just know that it needs to be a half mile. Now once you're more than a half mile from a sleeping area then it's okay to have gut piles and carcasses on the ground um, but if you have the opportunity to hang them um, we, we strongly recommend that. Now this can vary depending on which land management agency you're recreating with so check your local regulations and food storage orders but this is a, a good example of best practices. Now a big part of what makes hunting in bear country risky is having a carcass on the ground. So later on we'll talk about bear encounters, but right now we'll talk a little bit about carcass retrieval while we're on the topic of food storage. So first and foremost, if you're in bear country, particularly if you're in grizzly bear country or high density bears of any species, have a plan for how you're going to get an animal out of the backcountry if you're on foot or horseback um, or, or regardless of how you get back there. Know how you're going to address that. If you're hunting late in the day, be very cautious about making the decision to, to, to take an animal at that time of day, knowing that you may have to be doing some um, processing in the dark or that you may have to hike um, with 
with uh, quarters on your back in the dark uh, in bear country, which is a risky, risky thing to do. Uh, you're going to try to get the carcass out of the back country or out of the reach of bears as soon as possible. The longer it spends on the ground, the more likely it is a bear to find it, especially overnight. Um, if you have a partner with you, which we hope you do, have the partner keep watch while you're processing and keep your bear spray, or their bear spray and your bear spray handy. Now, if you do have to leave a carcass overnight, best to place it in plain view if possible. Now we know that not every situation is ideal and in hunting a lot of times it's not, but even if you can't necessarily see it perfectly from every angle, think about where you might come back to that spot so that you can see it from a ways away and plan your return route. The other thing you can do to reduce risk here is to separate the carcass parts you plan to keep away from the gut pile. Ideal situation would be that you pull the the gut pile downwind of the main carcass or that you take the carcass or quarters upwind of the gut pile. The reasoning here being that if a bear is coming into the scent of a carcass, which is the most likely scenario if they were if they were to find your carcass, it would be by scent, that they would find the gut pile before they found the part you intended to remove. So if you can get those separated um, so that you can safely approach the, the parts you intend to take with you and, and get the gut pile further downwind, that would be ideal. Now, if you're coming back to a carcass, think about where a bear might be in, in relation to where your animal is, scan the area, and if you can, approach it from upwind. We say to approach it from upwind so that if a bear is on the carcass, it can scent you before you get there. And if a bear is guarding the carcass, we'd rather them approach from a distance. They, they make themselves known rather than you getting in close to the carcass and the bear charging out from its daybed. So upwind, scanning, watching, making a lot of noise. Remember, once the animal's dead, you don't need to be quiet anymore. Make a lot of noise, shout, talk loudly, and when you come back to a carcass, don't come back alone. If you have horses, that's even better. I know not everyone has access, but if you do, that's the ideal way to come back to a carcass. If you return to your carcass and there's a bear on it, don't try to haze the bear away. Um, there's too much of a risk of harm to you to do that, and it's not worth endangering yourself. If you have this happen, just immediately report it to a game warden and let them know what happened and see what they can do for you. Um, while you're on a carcass, getting it ready to load out, make sure you're watching for bears that might be approaching, and just know that bears do bury their carcasses sometimes. So just like in this photo here, um, the, the animal may not be fully visible. One tip I have for when you have to leave an animal on the ground, um, this is from a, a fellow FWP employee who is also a hunter, is to, to stick a stick upright in the rib cage of your animal. And then um, if the bear comes back, if a bear approaches the carcass or is feeding on it while you're gone, you'll have seen that that stick moved. Um, it usually wouldn't be enough for a, a bird to move it, but a bear usually tries to roll the carcass over or move it around, so it would show signs of disturbance and make it a little bit safer for you. Um, the other reason we mention all of this, uh, and just to explain kind of how bears might act around um, a carcass that they have found, is that sometimes they bed nearby and you may not see the bear and it could be guarding a food source. Now we're going to transition from food storage and attractants to bear encounters. So we'll go through the best practices to prevent a bear encounter and talk a little bit about how those, those prevention measures aren't always easy to, to do when you're hunting and how you can get around or, or improve your odds of reducing an encounter. So our number one recommendation is to stay aware of your surroundings, to be alert. So I think this is one of the best tools that hunters possess when we're out in the field because we're inherently a lot more observant about the landscape and animals around us than a lot of other people who are in the woods. So look for sign, tracks, scat, and other things we talked about earlier, and just have your wits about you, be listening, smelling, looking, and pay attention. 
Travel in groups and stay together. Again, this is one of the general recommendations. I know not everybody has a partner to go with when they're hunting and that larger groups of people are often less successful if you have trouble sneaking up on an animal, right? So the recommendation here is that you still go with a partner and if at the very least, and again, strongly recommend you go together in a group at least of two, but three is ideal, um, that you at least tell somebody where you're going exactly where you're going and when to expect you back and have some kind of communication device with you. Make noise. Now this is a recommendation that works for almost everybody except for hunters in most situations. Now um, what I would say here is that you know you, you don't necessarily be, want to be making noise or else you may not ever sneak up on an animal but if you're in a particularly thick place where you think you might surprise a bear, you just have that sense, um, it's okay to make a little bit of localized noise that won't be heard over the ridge or, you know, even more than a hundred yards ahead of you, but just something so that you don't startle an animal where um, a bear from a bed right in front of you. So this is situational. It depends on your comfort level in bear country. It depends on if you're in an area with a lot of bears and just your sense of um, risk. So um, use your discretion here, but we understand that making noise while you're hunting is is an ask that most folks um, are are not going to necessarily do, but that once you get the animal on the ground, you can be making a lot of noise. And I have the photo of the river here with stock because anytime there's situations where there's more ambient noise, where a bear not, may not be able to hear you from far away, um, that's when you'd need to make more noise, just again, generally, but use your best judgment during hunting. And always have your bear spray handy and know how to use it. So obviously when we're hunting, we're, you know, we either have a bow or maybe a rifle, um, but it's good to also have your bear spray, more tools in the toolbox, and it's very, very effective. And it's really important that you carry it somewhere easy to get to. And then avoid traveling at night, at dawn, and at dusk. Uh, that's a, again, that's our, one of our general, rec general recommendations, but we know that most people who are out hunting are going to be active at dawn and dusk. So I would say this, just like with other parts of hunting, this is about the, the amount of risk you're willing to take. And this is up to you, but um, something you can do to reduce risk for moving at night uh, or in the dark is to go out and camp a little closer than than you would if you were hiking just from the trailhead so that you're closer to your your destination the night before that way you have fewer hours or you know miles to go in the dark another thing you can do is just hunt the morning hunt um, from from one spot or wait till the light comes up a little bit before you start moving still hunting through um, and again at dusk same thing um, the less you move around at those times when bears are active, the less likely you are to startle them. And I, I'll say it again, avoid carcass sites. Um, in places where a lot of people are successful during hunting season, you might have a lot of other carcasses on the landscape and just be cautious and take note of where you've seen them or anticipate they may be um, because bears have a memory that's both temporal and spatial, so um, time and space. So they know to go to certain places where a lot of animals are taken every year because they're looking for those gut piles. So if you know of a place where, yeah, you know, people usually get their elk, there's a good chance bears know that too. So keep that in mind. Now I want you to take a second to think about what you would do in a bear encounter. And maybe you've already had a bear encounter. Maybe you can use this question to kind of assess the experiences you've had. But I want to give you this as an update because a lot of us have lived in bear country for a long time and, and we haven't always taught the techniques of how to respond to a bear encounter the same way. We've updated some of them now. So if you see or hear things that are a little bit newer or different than what you're used to, just know that this is the most up-to-date information on assessing bear encounters. So update your, your knowledge here. So let's talk fundamentals of bear encounters. First of all, your behavior does matter. So what you do has an impact on what the bear does. So that's why it's important to think about it ahead of time. Never run from a bear. When bears are animals that are predators and animals that run from predators sometimes get chased. 
And the fact of the matter is no one here is faster than a bear. So, you know, running is, is never the solution, but we mention this because sometimes it's people's instinct. So train yourself mentally what you would do for an encounter and never run. Don't approach bears. That usually doesn't make the situation better. And that different situations call for different response. So we'll go through some scenarios. Now, if you see a bear at a distance and the bear doesn't see you, just quietly back out the way you came and try to plan a different route where you won't run into that bear again. Um, use caution, use your best judgment in the landscape in that particular situation to make a decision um, that's the safest for you. Now, if you have a close encounter with a bear, the bear sees you and you see the bear, stop, stand your ground and watch the bear's behavior. Now, before we get into anything else about behavior or species, I want you to know this. You can, at this point, if the bear is close enough, you can use your bear spray. And at the distance you can use bear spray is about 25 to 30 feet. So if you're feeling threatened, don't hesitate to, to use your bear spray if the bear is within range. A lot of people have heard to move away or slowly back away, but stand your ground until the bear disengages from you. So whether it's running away, um, it's kind of turned to the side and not watching you anymore, but slowly getting out of there, don't back up until it's disengaged. Because what can happen is if you start backing up when they're actively focused on you and upset, is that that can, that can invite them to approach. There are exceptions to everything. So if there's a situation where the bear is stuck um, for some reason, and when I say stuck, I mean like a, a female has cubs and the cubs are, you're between her and her cubs. She's not going to stop watching you. So you should back out and let her reunite with the cubs. Or if you have a, an encounter where you startle a bear on a carcass, that bear isn't going to give up the carcass and they're going to watch you. So you can back up in that situation, but um, generally wait till the bear disengages. In a close encounter, the bear's behavior should determine your response. And the most common kinds of bear encounters that we see fall generally into these two categories, defensive bears and predatory or curious bears. Now, defensive bears by far make up most of our bear encounters and attacks. Defensive bears are defending something, cubs, food, or space, and they're going to give you warning signs that they're upset and they're trying to get you to leave them alone or to, to get away from them. Alternatively, a predatory or curious bear is going to be interested, calm, focused, and not really projecting those warning signs like the other kind of encounter. So we'll get more into this. And then a third kind of encounter that's, I would just say, an outlier, but since some folks recreate in places that there are a lot of people, some bears are so used to seeing people, particularly around urban areas or popular park trails, that they may not even respond to the presence of people. They may completely ignore you. And, and this is not so much during hunting season we see, but more on, on trails, um, in busy, busy trails around places where a lot of people gather. So... If the bear completely ignores you, still give it a lot of space, but it's kind of it would just be a habituated reaction. So the bear has normalized seeing people. It doesn't mean that it's not wild anymore. It just means it doesn't react to every person it sees. So in that case, I would say um, just give it a lot of space and, and um, go on your way. Now, let's talk defensive bears. So bears that are defensive usually defending themselves a food like a carcass, large food sources, or they're young. And defensive bears can show a variety of behaviors, but I just want to mention this one first, that bears standing on their hind legs are often doing that just to see or smell better. It's not inherently an aggressive behavior, and usually when bears figure out what they're seeing, they'll go back on all fours and run away. Doesn't mean they couldn't still come towards you, but most of the time it does result in a retreat. This is not an inherently aggressive behavior, but if this bear does come within 25 or 30 feet, you could certainly use your bear spray. Bears have a kind of a spectrum of, of stress signs. So yawning would be one on the low end of the, of the, of the stress spectrum. Um, then it can get to extremely agitated. So this bear has a stiff posture. Its mouth is open. It's panting. It has its ears pinned back. But any vocalizations you hear, huffing, woofing, jaw popping, lip smacking, groaning, 
growling. These are usually agitated behaviors that would fall in the defensive category. Essentially, if you think what the bear is doing is trying to make you feel intimidated or scared, you're probably in a defensive encounter. Um, charging bears are typically defensive bears, so they're either bluff charging or charging. Bluffs are more common, but obviously you're not necessarily going to know that, so use your bear spray. Stand your ground, like you can see here, very agitated uh, female bear with her cub. And the only time that you should play dead I'm sure you've all heard that, is if a defensive bear makes physical contact or it's about to. You should never play dead if you're in an encounter with a curious bear because you don't want to look vulnerable to a bear that might think you're food. So there's only one caveat to this playing dead and that's, um, we, we, we usually just talk about behavior here, but we have one species caveat. If you are 100% sure that the bear you are dealing with is a black bear, then there's no situation in which you should play dead. But one thing to know is that most of the encounters where people have with black bears, um, even in a defensive encounter, it's pretty unlikely that they make physical contact. It's, it's more common that black bears would make physical contact in more of a predatory or curious bear encounter. So. Don't worry too much about the species, but if you're sure it's a black bear, you still don't play dead, and if they make contact, you'd fight back. But if you're not sure of the species, which really we don't always have the time to determine that, play dead for bears that are defending themselves and who you think are going to make contact with you. Now let's switch over to a discussion about predatory bear behavior. So bears who are predatory, um, don't show signs of stress usually. They are calm, curious, and interested. Head up, ears forward, perhaps following, stalking, sniffing. And you might have noticed in my in the last section about the defensive bear, I didn't say you should make yourself look big or scary. However, with the curious or predatory bear, that's exactly what you should do. Because the the idea that you're trying to get across to this bear is that you're dangerous and they shouldn't get any closer. So stand your ground, get aggressive, wave your arms, obviously use your bear spray if it's within range. And I want to tell you this is true regardless of the species of bear. Grizzly bear, black bear, I don't care. If it's acting curious or predatory, fight back, use your bear spray, and be aggressive. Fighting back obviously when it's when the bear makes contact with you. Again, you'd never play dead for a curious bear. And I want to mention this too, if any bear ever enters or reaches into your tent, you're dealing with a predatory bear most likely, and that's a very serious situation. You need to use your bear spray and fight back with whatever tools you have. Now to, on to bear spray. So bear spray is a very, very effective tool to stop or deter a bear attack from happening. The way it works is by spraying a fine mist of capsaicin oleoresin, which is a hot chili pepper oil, into a cloud that expands to about 25 to 30 feet away from you in a cone-shaped pattern. The bear spray makes it hard for the bear to see, breathe, and smell, and it's um, stinging and burning it basically in its lungs, its sinuses, nose, mouth, eyes, and gives you a chance to get away. When you are carrying bear spray, just remember to treat it like a weapon. If you have little ones in the house, um, either make sure if they're mature enough, they know that that should only be handled with adult permission or little kids keep it out of reach. Um, it's not, a, it's not a, a lethal weapon for, for the most part. And I mean, I'm saying that in case, you know, somebody had a severe aller or um, asthma attack or something, but not a lethal weapon, but very dangerous. You don't want it to go off in your house. Um, check your expiration date here. So the cans have an expiration date that often rubs off the label. So I always write it on the bottom of the can with a marker. While you're traveling in a vehicle, make sure you're transporting it inside, inside one of these cases. Or if you don't have a travel case like this, at least put it inside of a backpack or inside of a cooler. We don't want it to explode while it's in a vehicle and then check it for punctures in good condition. Make sure the safety is always on the can. And if you're traveling by yourself, we recommend two cans of bear spray. 
This is what can happen if bear spray explodes in a hot car. So again, that's why it's important to carry it carefully and transport it um, in a way that, that can contain that if it does get hot. Bear spray is really easy to use, which is one of its benefits. You don't have to practice much with it. You just have to get comfortable taking that safety off. And the best way to do that is to practice with a, an inert can, a practice can, um, or you can very carefully outside practice taking the safety off your spray and then putting it back on but um, we don't teach test fire just make sure you get that safety um, figured out here's a video showing how to actually spray the bear spray Now, if you have to spray a bear, um, spray at a slightly downward angle until the bear changes behavior. And at this point, I want to mention that you can also use bear spray on other animals like mountain lions, moose, anything, any mammals particularly that might threaten you, bear spray works great. And the reason we're we're such big proponents of bear spray is that it's very effective. The most recent research from 2008 looked at um, a bunch of cases of people using bear spray on bears. You can search this citation here if you'd like to read more. 92% of people who used bear spray on bears changed the bear's behavior. 98% of the people, so the same encounters, only 98% 90, of the people were unharmed by the bear. So that doesn't mean you can't be hurt by a bear when you use bear spray, but it's very, very unlikely. And it works very well because of the fact that it changes the bear's focus off of you and onto the, the pain it's feeling from the bear spray, letting you get away. Some key things to know about bear spray. It's not worth having unless it's somewhere you can have it easy to get to. It doesn't like make any sense or it's not practical to carry it in your backpack make sure it's in a good holster somewhere you can reach easily with the activity that you're doing know how to use the safety spray until the bear changes behavior cans contain five to eight seconds of spray depending on the brand so train yourself for different scenarios mentally and physically and develop those reflexes basically so that where the mind has been the body will follow you'll have a chance to have tried it out before Here are some examples of how to carry your bear spray, but I'm sure there are others that work well. There's no right or wrong as long as you can get to it easily. But most often uh, I see people carrying it on a hip holster, but some other options that work well. For me, I really like using a binocular harness um, for hunting season or anytime I'm using my binoculars because the bear spray is always right there. And even if I take my pack off, I can get to it quickly. People also like chest holsters. You can uh, use lumbar packs. You can use them in a holster there. I just caution you that to not carry your bear spray in a water bottle pocket on your back that's too far back for you to get to it easily. Make sure you can reach it really quickly and have it ready to deploy. When you're using bear spray, know that you need to check to make sure it hasn't expired and if it has expired, um, you, you can discharge the can somewhere safe away from backyards, trailheads, livestock, animals, people, and do it on a day where you have a, a like a gentle, consistent wind um, so you don't get the bear spray back on yourself. And then depending on where you are in the state, the best thing to do is just call one of your local FWP offices or your waste management company to find out what they're doing with recycling or disposing of the cans. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want um, somebody in waste management to get bear spray on them because someone just threw a can in the trash. And you can purchase inert bear spray, the practice kind, so that you don't have to risk getting real bear spray on you while you prepare. If you get real bear spray on your skin, uh, the best first aid is for your skin is soap and water. Bear spray being an oil-based product, you need the soap to wash the spray off of your skin. Avoid inhalation of bear spray. Obviously, um, that's very irritating, just like it is to the bear. And if you get bear spray in your eyes, you need to irrigate with cool, clean water until you don't feel the symptoms anymore. And if you have to clean gear that's been contaminated by bear spray, clean it outside in cool, soapy water. The reason we're saying outside is if you, if you do it indoors or with hot water, it kind of reactivates the bear spray and um, it can make it, you cough and react to it again. 
So in summary and review, I encourage you to take some time to ask yourself, do you know what to do if you saw a bear in a close encounter that was agitated or perhaps if it was intent and that you know and you're ready to um, handle your food storage when you go out into the field this year. I want to quickly thank all of the different groups that contributed photos to this presentation and uh, leave my contact information here in case anyone has any questions you can email me or you can ask via our social media accounts or you can call any of your local regional Fish, Wildlife and Parks offices. So thank you for tuning in today and we hope you have a great hunting season.